morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And it is a real pleasure to be here in Zacatecas to celebrate with you the RNA world and the 25th anniversary of your science here. And a special thanks to Jesus for being a wonderful host. And uh, a special thanks to the translator for translating. I'll try and go slowly. Um, I've learned quite a few things about Zacatecas while I'm here. One of them is if I have a dry throat. There's water here, but I also brought this. Thank you very much. We'll see if I need that during the seminar. Okay, I, I tried to make this seminar um, a little special for the students. I've enjoyed meeting with you, I've enjoyed talking with you, and I thought a little bit I would tell you um, some things that were helpful for me in, in uh, go, going from the stage of a student, like many of you are, to uh, running a laboratory. And one thing that came up in discussion was how to think about science and how to make progress in your thinking about science. Um, so when I was young, just like many of you students have come to me with ideas, like Stephen did yesterday with papers, um, the question is, how do you pursue your ideas and turn them into something real, a, a career in science? So one thing I want to point out um, is this is a very useful website. Thank you, Lynn McQuatt, for suggesting I put this up here. This is um, a site where you can search for research papers, many of which are free and available on the internet. So if you go to this site, it's called PubMed. It's run by the NIH, National Institute of Health. And you can type in here anything you're interested in. So when I was a student, what I typed in here was proto-oncogenes and brain. Actually, that's not true. There was no PubMed when I was a student. <laughs> back in the dark ages. Um, but that's what I would have done now. And when I, when I searched that, I became interested basically in the overlap between cancer and the brain. And in doing that search, I came up with zero. When I, I first became interested in the idea of looking at cancer in the brain, there was really no overlap between the two. Proto-oncogenes were genes important for cancer formation but they weren't thought to be important for the brain because your brain is made up of neurons that don't do any dividing. And nowadays, if you do that search, the number of results are, I think, 36,000. But if you go, or, no, I'm sorry, 13,000. If you go to the very first ones, the, the literature started on overlap between cancer and the brain in about 1985. And there are some actually very interesting papers here um, from some very famous laboratories. Um, I'm going to put my glasses on. I can't see my own slides. No. So uh, these got me interested, these early papers, in trying to choose a scientific pathway that was relevant uh, for cancer biology and for neurobiology. And in fact, uh, one of the early papers was about uh, a nerve growth factor receptor that is present in tumor cells, not on this slide. So one thing that was important in taking these ideas forward was being both stubborn about wanting to study what I was interested in and also being flexible because it turns out some of my original ideas were no good. So in fact, what came together in the end was a little bit of luck. So I took these ideas of cancer in the brain and went and got trained in neuro-oncology, which is um, medical training for uh, doctors interested in brain disease and cancer. And while I was doing that training, I came across a very rare group of neurologic disorders that fit exactly what I was interested in. They have an overlap between cancer biology and brain biology. So the, these are called perineoplastic, meaning neoplasm, neurologic, meaning brain, degeneration. So they're degenerative diseases. And I'll show you a movie of, of what the overlap uh, 
comes out white. So this is a patient thing. And this patient has perineoplastic cerebellar degeneration. You can see her hand has very bad coordination of movement. Well, we've seen hundreds of patients like this now, and, and what they have in common <coughs> is that when they become sick like this, uh, it can happen very rapidly, over a week, and in patients who were previously healthy. But in fact, we now know that they were not previously healthy. Patients like this have had cancer for some period of time and not ever had a diagnosis. So what is going on? What we believe is happening is that these patients have cancer cells in their body, commonly breast, ovarian cancer, lung cancer, some lymphomas. Um, and those cancers oftentimes like to express abnormal proteins. And sometimes those proteins include proteins that are normally made in neurons inside your brain. Now, there's something called a blood-brain barrier, and your immune system, which is normally looking for viruses, normally doesn't go into your brain. So when a cancer cell turns on a protein that is normally a neuronal protein in the brain, your body, in this patient's body, makes an immune attack against the cancer. So this patient has a, a useful immune response. Actually, these are the best known examples of human tumor immunity in which the immune system can attack the cancer successfully in some cases. So that goes on for maybe a year, maybe two years. The patient doesn't know they have cancer because they're attacking it and suppressing it. Then a second event occurs, which is the blood-brain barrier gets broken and the immune system gets into the brain, finds the cells that were normally making this protein and attacks them. And when it does that, the patient gets very sick. So in this disease, uh, the ovarian cancer turns on a protein normally made in the back of the brain in the cerebellum in an area that controls movement. And the tumor has triggered an immune response that's led to an autoimmune attack in the brain and loss of these neurons in the cerebellum. So in fact, it was Jerry Posner, who's a master clinical neurologist in Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where I was a young resident, um, who had put together several of these syndromes and he had made this immunologic connection by looking in their serum for autoantibodies. They could recognize the cancer like this, that's the brown stain here, and could recognize relevant areas of the nervous system like this. These are the Purkinje neurons in the cerebellum. And of course, this may sound familiar. In fact, it had all already been done uh, in a different disorder. And you heard about that on the first day. This is Joan Stites's work. Um, doing something very similar with lupus. And she talked to you about that a couple of days ago where you can take blood from patients with lupus and characterize it by Western blots uh, where you look for the antibody in the blood to bind to certain proteins and that's how she discovered SNRPs. So of course I, I loved that work and wanted to emulate it. So um, we went then and, and took blood from these patients which had antibodies against these neuronal proteins and did Western blots. And you can see here um, <clears throat> the antibody drawn from the blood of this patient can detect proteins on a protein uh, block here. And different patients, in fact, who have different diseases that look similar can be seen to have different pathophysiologies, different uh, recognition of different autoimmune antigens by this sort of technique. So it's very similar to what uh, Joan Stites had already pioneered in the analysis of different SNRP proteins. And of course, these were brain proteins and we didn't know what they were. So we went one step further in uh, 1987 and used the sort of same technique of antibody staining to, instead of doing a Western blot, screen a cDNA library. And in that way, we were able to identify a single cDNA that made the protein that was under attack here and that was under attack in the patient's tumor and, and body. So that opened the doors to understanding very quickly what was the disease pathophysiology, what was the target antigen, what is the brain cancer protein, we call onconeural proteins, that are recognized. And the first one that we found was, in fact, a brain-specific protein that tumor cells had turned on, which was a vesicle coat protein. 
And you can see here the cDNA uh, allowed us to do a northern blot and look for the RNA expression that it was made in the brain, but not in any other tissues, consistent with this model that these are brain-specific proteins. So I'm going to turn to uh, a question now of, from a clinical question to a more basic question for most of the rest of the talk. So this is, again, the clinical observation. This is a lung cancer in one of these patients that spontaneously disappeared. We published this in New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago. And while this disappeared, the patient developed a perineoplastic syndrome. So the question arises, why would a cancer cell express a protein like this if it puts itself at risk of being eradicated by the immune system? And in fact, as we know now, many cancers turn on these perineoplastic antigens. So it suggests maybe that the tumors like to take certain brain proteins and use them out of context in the tumor. So we'd like to know what the nature of these perineoplastic antigens are. What do they normally do in the brain, and why is the cancer expressing them? So to turn to that, I'm going to talk in detail about a different perineoplastic syndrome called perineoplastic opsoclonus myoclonus ataxia. It's unrelated to the first one I showed you, but this is a real-time video that I'd like to show. This is one of our patients. If you look at his eyes, he is unable to stop his eyes from moving. So when he looks quickly to the side, they don't stop, and they have what's called opsoclonus, this nice staggered flutter in the uh, vertical and horizontal plane. And lying down, he's okay, but when he gets up, he can't stop his muscles from moving. So this is interpreted by neurologists as a double negative a failure to inhibit motor movements from the brain. So a double negative is a positive. So if you can't inhibit, you have too much motor activity. So some problem in balance of excitation and inhibition generally. So we use the serum for patients like this, about eight have been described, um, to clone this cDNA that encodes the target antigen. And at the same time, we help Jerry Posner use uh, serum from another set of patients, which I won't show you now, to clone another antigen that's unrelated either in the neurologic disorder or the protein itself, but does uh, share some striking similarities. So the first one from this patient I showed you, we named the antigen NOVA, which stands for onconeural ventral antigen because it's expressed very heavily in the ventral part of the spinal cord. It turns out there's another family member it's expressed in the rest of the brain. Um, and this antigen, again, just like the first one I showed you, is very specific to the brain. There's no expression in other tissues. And the same with this protein, which has a actual repeated domains in red that, that have a similar structure to NOVA in terms of architecture, but no sequence relationship. And again, this one's expressed exclusively in brain and not at all in other tissues. So. These two seemingly different diseases had something very interesting in common, which is um, El Mundo del RNA, if I get that right. Um, they both turn out to code for brain-specific RNA binding proteins. So what does that mean? It means that the brain has a system for regulating RNA metabolism at some level that other cells in the body simply don't have. And that's quite different from transcription factors, for example, that in general, even brain-specific transcription factors, like homeobox proteins you may have heard about, at some level in development are used in other cells of the body. But for these RNA binding proteins, we've looked at all developmental ages. This is early in development and late in development. We don't see usage outside of neurons. So why is that interesting, and why did this catch our attention? So, to understand that, there, there's several points to make for the students. Um, the first being that um, you know, the brain is very complicated. And when, the, as Joan Stites alluded to, I think, in her talk, when the genome was sequenced, um, we thought that there would be many, many genes in humans that would explain why we're different from something like a worm. And in fact, we have now probably between 20 and 25,000 genes that code for proteins. And C. elegans, the worm, has the same number of genes, essentially the same genes coding for more or less the same set of proteins. So there's an existential crisis, if you will, in molecular biology when that happened, 
when the, the discovery was made because we think of our brains, our cells, our neurons as more complicated than those in the worm C. elegans. So the fact that the brain has its own system for regulating RNA maybe is important in this context. So let's consider how that could be. Different levels of RNA control um, have the off, uh, offer the possibility of adding complexity to the 23,000 genes that we have. And this has been gone over uh, a little bit before. I'll just review for you. Combinatorial complexity can happen at the RNA level in the nucleus. And as Joan went through in detail, alternative splicing is a way where extra information can either be included or excluded. And one of the very first alternative exons was discovered by Ron Evans to be a neuron-specific alternative exon. It makes a completely different protein in the brain than is made in other cells in, in the thyroid gland. So in fact, if transcripts have many exons that can be in or out, and each one can be independently regulated, like a computer, a one or a zero, in a binary fashion, for each one that's alternatively spliced, you can have two to the n different protein variants. Meaning that if there are 10 different exons that can be alternatively spliced in one gene, you could make two to the 10th or 1,000, 1024, different protein variants from a single protein coding genes. So that would amplify your complexity by a thousand fold. And you can add on to that other levels of complexity. There's differences in the three prime N that can regulate how much expression is uh, made from a protein coding gene. Um, and some of recent evidence about this being especially complicated in the brain is shown in those um, references. There's RNA editing, which uh, has been alluded to, where the primary RNA sequence can be changed after it's copied from the DNA. And that change can add completely new features. And again, one of the first examples of the importance of that was made in the brain um, by Peter Sieber. And uh, recently, George Church published a paper looking at RNA editing and again showing that it was explosively complicated in the brain. Another thing RNA can do that DNA can't is leave the nucleus. So that's especially important in the brain where each of these branches is a connection through an incoming uh, neuron. And at a microscopic level, it's believed that little bits of gene information, not DNA but RNA, can sit out at these connection points called synapses and allow local regulation of gene expression that could, for example, strengthen this synapse and weaken this one to allow you to learn fine motor movements, for example, or to think. Um, now, in trying to understand what an RNA binding protein like NOVA or the HU antigens are doing in the brain, um, what one would like to do is similar to what you would do for a transcription factor. So if you had a new protein, P53, that binds DNA, to figure out what it does, you'd like to know what DNA sequence does it bind to. And in the RNA world, it's the same sort of thing. If you have a new RNA binding protein, one of the important things you'd like to know is what RNA does it bind to. Now that's been um, doable um, by the work of, of pioneers like Joan, um, in the test tube for many years, but doing that in the brain has been very difficult. And really, I'll talk about attempts to understand what RNA protein interactions are going on in living tissues, including normal brain and human disease brain, uh, for the rest of the talk. Now, in terms of explaining my addiction and excitement about brain-specific RNA binding proteins, uh, there's another basic point that I thought I would bring out for the students that I found to be just fascinating thinking about over the years. And this has to do with the topic of the meeting here, uh, the RNA world, and the central dogma, which was alluded to in Luisa's talk earlier, um, can, in a somewhat joking way, be thought to be dead now. And that is because Jim Watson, in particular, really pushed the idea of a hierarchy of importance where DNA was at the top of a pyramid of uh, information content, RNA was sort of an annoying intermediate, and protein was the final output from the cell. It was really um, Tom Check, my ex-boss, who rattled this central dogma completely. So he studied a very primitive organism called tetrahymena, which is a ciliated protozoan 
What that means in translation is it's a hairy cell, single cell organism. That was a joke. And um, in this hairy cell, there we go, delayed laughter. Uh, in this hairy cell, he was studying alternative splicing. Very good. Okay. Now I see how far behind the translator is. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Pardon. <laughs> so he was studying alternative splicing of, of uh, mRNA that had an intron here that is cut out to make an intervening sequence and a mature mRNA sequence here. And he did something really fascinating. Okay, because he set up a, a reagent purely in a test tube with nothing in the test tube but this RNA and an extract from nuclei that from tetrahymena that would allow this to be spliced. And he wanted to study what are the necessary components for splicing to occur. And very interestingly, he did it, actually his, I guess it was his postdoctoral fellow, um, uh, Zhao, did a control experiment where they actually could get the splicing to occur in the test tube, but he did a control where he left out the splicing extract from the nucleus. So he just had the RNA by itself. And amazingly, when he left, this is the splice product, when, it, when he left the entire extract out, the RNA all by itself cut out this intervening sequence. And as Tom Check says, he went back to his postdoc, Art Zaug, and said, well, Art, that was a very nice experiment, but I think you made a mistake on the control. Well, it turned out, of course, they followed up this in great detail, and it wasn't a mistake. That the RNA all by itself purified in the test tube was sufficient to cut itself out. And that meant that RNA, which is of course nucleic acid, it's a genetic material, this one, also is able to act, not only as a genetic material, sort of like DNA, but can act like a protein, as enzyme activity. So that was a revelation and uh, created really the RNA world. The idea, this is a cell here, that the original form of life on the planet Earth was a membrane with RNA in it. Nothing more, no mas. <laughs> so this was a real revolution in thinking. And um, of course, as all great revolutions, suggests a lot of important things. One of them, in thinking about neuron-specific RNA binding proteins, is that RNA complexity and RNA at the essence of biology on the planet Earth is not simply discarded as an intermediate in this picture, but is perhaps at the core of complex functions, like those that have evolved to be immune cells or brain cells. So that's a very interesting idea that you can take home from this talk, even if you don't understand anything more I have to say. <laughs> Which is quite possible. <laughs> now, I, another interesting point about um, fundamental discoveries like this is that if you look back, they've often been predicted earlier. And in this case, of course, the central dogma lives on, not so much because of Jim Watson, but because of Francis Crick, who in the year after uh, this, this publication um, made a, a revised version of this central dogma in which Crick realized that RNA could potentially be reverse transcribed into DNA, essentially predicting the discovery of reverse transcriptase by David Baltimore and Howard Temin, and said the only irreversible part on this pathway is that protein cannot go backwards to nucleic acid, which as, we, as far as we know is true in biology. So the last point in terms of proselytizing, uh, good luck translating that word, arguing, um, for the, uh, spending a career on studying the role of RNA in the brain is this. I can hear your cut up. Um, so it, it, it turns out that there is a growing list of human brain diseases, neurologic diseases that we see as neurologists that turn out to be caused by errors in RNA regulation. And some of these have been mentioned. Uh, Lynn mentioned the muscular dystrophy. Um, I'll mention briefly this one, frontotemporal dementia, some of the Parkinson's uh, dementia 
dementia disorders. We're going to mention fragile X syndrome. We're talking already about the perineoplastic diseases. There are thoughts psychiatric disease could be related to RNA dysregulation. And if we have time and you're good, I may talk about Lou Gehrig's disease. So, how do we figure out what an RNA binding protein is doing specially in the brain? That goes back to the basics. You need to do basic biochemistry. And we did that using um, beautiful methods um, worked out by Jack Shostak uh, at, at, in Boston, who won the Nobel Prize last year, in part for his thinking of this sort of uh, in vitro evolution, where we evolved RNAs from a random library of RNAs that had a complexity of 10 to the 15th different RNAs of 52 nucleotides each, and asked which of those many, many different RNAs could bind to our NOVA protein. And we found uh, a very uh, robust consensus, which is that this protein likes to bind repeats of a small sequence, which is rich in pyrimidines, used in C's, with an A residue right there in the middle, and has a, a structural component to it as well. And we understood this in greater detail by doing crystallography of the RNA protein complex, um, presaging Harry Noller's talk uh, after mine, and um, simply to show you a structure that is. And so, in no other way really presaging your talk, Harry. Um, so this is the protein, and the protein has folded through evolution to have side chain amino acids here that exactly donate the appropriate hydrogen bond uh, reactions with the RNA, U, C, A, C here, uh, so that the protein is acting like a second strand nucleic acid to very exactly specify the sequence that NOVA can bind to. So it's what we would call a low complexity sequence. It really only mandates a C and an A residue exactly and to a lesser degree a perimity. But we think it binds to stretches of these, which helps confer its specificity. I'm going to skip over a bunch of work in which we try to identify RNAs in the test tube, mostly, and with crude attempts uh, of bioinformatics to identify RNAs that had these binding sites in them. And what we discovered was that the, the binding sites tended to be in pre-messenger RNAs, where if here, for example, there's a binding site in an intron, intervening sequence, that's spliced out. And interestingly, these tended to be in introns that were next to alternatively spliced exons that could either be in that binary fashion, in or out. So it suggested that NOVA could regulate alternative splicing in a binary in or out way and be an important regulator of this complexity of information in the brain. Now, um, we could in fact show that in tissue culture cells, we could show that in in vitro splicing assays, and we learned quite a great deal about the mechanisms of that. And I'm not going to talk about that, because I want to stay focused in this talk on the brain, because these discoveries were a little bit unsatisfying. And by that, I mean um, they kept me awake at night. So that's another pearl for the students. Um, when you're awake at night worrying about your work, you're doing well. So I was doing well because I was a complete insomniac. So I worried whether this was only true in a test tube or whether this might be true in the brain. So for that, we did something that hadn't been done before at the time, was we made a mouse uh, knockout in which it was missing uh, the Nova gene. <laughs> and uh, this was done uh, by a whole bunch of people in the laboratory, uh, led by Kirk Jensen and uh, Yerna Yule then took the RNA from these mice and compared it, the RNA from a knockout in a wild type, on a standard AFI matrix microarray. And I'm not going to go into what that is because this is technology that is now um, antiquated. But nonetheless, what he was able to do was to compare the RNA binding um, of a knockout in a wild type of animal on a special kind of microarray. And I just want to point out here that this is a microarray in which probe sets were testing alternative splice exons. So this probe set, for example, would test how much of exon 9 was spliced to exon 10 by having probes that span that junction. And elsewhere on the chip was a probe set that would test how much exon 9 skipped over 10 and went directly to 11. And um, 
these are the probe sets for such, such a splice. So we could look specifically for alternative splicing on a genome-wide, unbiased way in the mouse brain of a wild type and compare that to a mutant mouse. And when we did that, we got a, a large number of targets that um, are shown here that we could validate by comparing um, RT-PCR and the exon junction array. And what I mean by that is we could go back from different animals, take the RNA and make PCR primers, for example, these two, that bound this alternative exon. And we should get two products. One would be a bigger product in which the exon is included, and one a smaller product in which the exon is skipped. And then we can test the ratio of how much big product, how much little product there is in the wild type, and how much there is in the knockout. So these are examples here from about 75 targets that we could validate. And you can see here in each case, in the wild type animal, there's a given amount of a big product and a little product. And in the knockout animal, that ratio is flipped. In some cases, there's more big product in the wild type. In some cases, there's more big product in the knockout. Um, and that suggests that in some cases, NOVA could enhance the inclusion of an exon, and in some cases, it could block it. So this sort of information um, was incredibly useful because it gave us a large list of targets that NOVA regulated. But there's a weakness here that is worth noting, and I put it in Spanish. Um, so the weakness is a correlación, if I got my pronunciation correct. Right? So uh, it's like a person studying ESP. Um, if you flip a coin enough times, um, you're going to, by chance, be able to predict that it was going to come up tails. I knew it. Right? So that's a correlation. It doesn't actually prove that you had extrasensory perception, which is in the news recently. Anyway, um, it's a, a treacherous area in science where you can have two observations that fit on the surface but may not be directly related. So, for example, t we, this, what this really tells us is that taking NOVA away affects the alternative splicing of a large number of genes, but it doesn't actually tell us that NOVA is regulating those genes directly. So, for example, perhaps NOVA regulates one master regulator of splicing, and that's indirectly regulating all these genes. We want to know what NOVA is actually binding to directly. And maybe we've led ourselves down a happy trail here, but we've been misled by a correlation. So we tried to get around that um, in a quick and dirty way by using bioinformatics rather than biochemistry. And uh, this was fun and interesting, um, but not definitive. Nonetheless, I'll take you just briefly through what we did, was we made a list of all of the transcripts where NOVA was showing regulation. Some transcripts it's enhancing splicing, illustrated by this alternate exon being red. And some transcripts it's blocking splicing, illustrated by the alternate exon being blue. And these are the bounding constitutive exons on either side. So we had 75 of these. And we asked, they were discovered with this RNA array completely independently of our knowledge of what NOVA binds to from the crystal structure. So suppose we go back to these 75 transcripts and ask, do they have binding sites, or at least predicted binding sites for NOVA, looking for clusters of this YCAY element? And in fact, when we did that, we could see that there were certain positions in these 75 transcripts where YCAY elements were very enriched. And to our surprise, we actually discovered something unknown here, which was that all the transcripts where NOVA blocked splicing had enrichment of binding sites in these blue positions. And all the transcripts where NOVA enhanced splicing had enrichments of, of binding sites in these red positions. So what that means is it's suggestive, although not a biochemical proof, but suggestive of uh, the conclusion that NOVA is regulating splicing by binding to the YCNY sites in these transcripts. But more than that, that the binding, the position of the binding site determines the outcome of the alternative splicing. So that if you bind here, you enhance splicing, and if you bind here, you block it. And that has turned out to be a general rule, true for a large number of splicing factors now. And the details, mechanistic details of exactly how this is working are still not completely understood. Uh, quite interesting to think about, though. I'm not going to talk about it more, but this is a list of factors that fit this rule. <coughs> 
Now, a second thing that we did with this list of 75 targets um, was to ask, what are they coding for? What is NOVA putatively, directly, maybe still indirectly regulating? Um, what are the nature of the transcripts in terms of the proteins that they code for? And here we had another very interesting discovery, which is the vast majority, about 90 plus percent, of the RNAs that NOVA regulates code for proteins that are synaptic proteins. So that means uh, that there is a very strict biologic coherence, meaning um, similarity to the set of um, biologic events that NOVA is regulating. And in fact, what it, it's regulating is not the quantity of proteins in the synapse, but really their quality. So it's regulating the, the shape of the biology of the synapse, if you will. Now, if that's true, um, one way to try and test that is to predict little pieces of neurophysiology, especially at these synapses, these electrical connections, should be defective in mice or even in humans that, where NOVA is under attack. So here's an example where we can take a subset of these that predict parts of electrical activity that should be wrong in the NOVA knockout mouse. And in fact, this is the NOVA knockout. I just wanted to show you what it looks like. Um, it actually phenocopies the human quite well, where at rest it's okay. But when it walks, it has this action-induced tremor, again, like the human did, suggesting it has a failure of inhibition, double negative, of motor system, so it has too much activity. That in fact, it's so severely affected, it has hind limb atrophy and goes on to die, suggesting it also has severe problems in its motor neurons. Nonetheless, this balance between excitation and inhibition led us to look and ask whether the mouse had epilepsy. And in fact, what we found was not only does this mouse have epilepsy, but the heterozygous mice that have one normal copy of NOVA and one missing, which we thought were completely normal, those mice still have electrical discharges and secondary epileptic seizures. So this is a common problem in humans, and this is an unexpected entree to understand something better about human epilepsy. Now, the weakness in the motor neurons here suggested another series of experiments. So one of the um, motor neuron targets for NOVA um, was a RNA that codes for a protein called agarin. And agarin had been well studied in neurobiology as actually a master regulator of what's called the neuromuscular junction. So this is the end of a motor neuron, and this is a muscle. And this junction is absolutely essential for you to move. It's where when you think to move your finger, a motor neuron fires, goes down to the muscle, the lumbrical muscle in your finger, and makes it fire, and your finger moves. And in fact, this is a motor neuron from the diaphragm leading to um, your ability to breathe. And in red here are the uh, acetylcholine receptors that are the receiving part of the muscle. So the receptors are in the muscle, and the nerve is coming down in green here. And what had been known is that um, mice that are missing a special exon in agarin called the Z-plus exon are born alive but are paralyzed because they can't move any of their neuromuscular junctions and they asphyxiate. They die from lack of breathing. And we had found in our screen for NOVA targets that NOVA is the regulator of this special alternate exon. So here's the large and small isoforms of agarin. This is the Z plus exon. And here, in mice that don't have NOVA, uh, they make very little of the Z plus exon. And in fact, the reason we began studying this is, I mentioned to you earlier, there are two NOVA genes, a NOVA1 and a NOVA2 gene. When we knock both of them out together, the animals couldn't even crawl. In fact, they were paralyzed. They were born alive and they asphyxiated, which made, made us think of this story about agri. So, in fact, when we look at the neuromuscular junction of NOVA knockout mice, missing both double knockout, NOVA 1 and NOVA 2, they, their motor neurons are not connected properly to the muscle. The acetylcholine receptor is, is disconnected. And that's exactly what mice that Josh Sains made look like that are missing just the Z plus exon. So at this point, we did a control experiment, always a good thing to do in science, as Lynn was referring to. And the control was to mate these double knockout mice with mice that now constitutively restored 
the Z plus exon from a cDNA driven from a motor neuron promoter provided by um, Steve Burden at NYU. And when we made it, so this is now a triple mouse, missing two copies of NOVA and plus just the Z plus aggregate rescuing this defect. Sure enough, it rescued the defect. Look how beautiful that is. All the red acetylcholine receptors are now reconnected to the motor neuron. Another surprise in science. These mice are still paralyzed. So they are born alive, but they remain paralyzed. So this broke open a little piece of dogma in the neuromuscular field, which was, yes, the Z plus exon in this transcript is essential for formation of the neuromuscular junction. Um, but it's not uh, the entire story. There are other things, and we know that NOVA is only made in the neuron, not in the muscle. So there are other splice, presumably splice changes in the motor neuron, maybe other changes as well, that NOVA is doing in addition to the Z plus exon, and some examples, candidates that we're interested in are, are here, that are necessary not only for the clustering here, but for the whole motor neuron to work. And we wrote in detail about this very interesting story here. So I want to come back to um, this cynicism of correlation versus correlation. So again, uh, we were not comfortable, we were not sleeping at night. Um, in our concern that NOVA might, for example, even though we had this connection with YCAY elements, maybe NOVA is only binding some of them and other RNA binding proteins, and there are hundreds of RNA binding proteins in the brain, some of which bind sequences similar to YCAY, like the Fox proteins bind the sequence GCAY, not so far away. Maybe those are regulating the blue ones, and NOVA's regulating the red ones, or it's not so clear. We can't make it the assumption that this correlation is valid. So one of the things we tried very early on was to immunoprecipitate the NOVA protein and try and pull the RNA down with it. And this is a technique called RNA immunoprecipitation, or RIP. And um, there are a great many technical challenges we found with this technique, and which is not to say that it can't sometimes be useful. And I would say Lynn McQuan is one of the few people in the world who's got this working reasonably well. Um, but there are still lots of heartaches with this technique, and I'll just show you a few. When you do this sort of immunoprecipitation, you have to keep the RNA and the protein bound to each other. So they can't be too stringent. So other proteins that are co-precipitating with NOVA can come along for the ride. And for many of our RNA binding proteins, one of which that I'll talk about in the third hour while my plane is gone, um, is the Fragile X syndrome. That, that's known to bind 12 different RNA binding proteins. So, um, and each of those RNA binding proteins can bind to their own RNA. So in allowing your, in our case, NOVA to be bound to its RNA, we're at risk of finding indirect RNAs that are co-precipitating here, that really may be interesting, but not what we fundamentally want to know about. Another problem, which actually Joan Stites figured out, is that there's an off rate that's significant for these RNAs. They can fall off. And when they fall off, other RNAs can come back on there. And Joan, with a postdoc uh, named Mealy, published a beautiful paper proving that this happens during the process of communal precipitation. Um, so these things can rearrange in vitro. It's a problem with protein-protein interactions, and it's certainly a problem with protein-RNA interactions. So for these reasons, um, we felt that new techniques were needed to work around this problem. And the technique that we did was uh, to develop something called cross-linking immunoprecipitation, or CLIP. And, in, and this procedure, first of all, we wanted something that would work in the mouse brain. Um, so we up adopted uh, something that had already been very well established by Joan Stites and others. Um, and Reinhard Lerman in vitro have used this technique um, to UV irradiate uh, RNA protein complexes. So it was well known that if you shine UV light on an RNA uh, protein interaction, if they're directly bound about one angstrom apart, they'll jump to an excited state and form a covalent bond. And once that covalent bond is formed, you can't get them apart. And that's very advantageous because then you can purify this complex away from all those other um, secondary proteins and RNAs. So we applied this technique to the mouse brain directly and worked out conditions 
there won't be labor where we could then grind up the brain very stringently immunoprecipitate protein RNA complexes and we now do this in many experiments by heating to 90 degrees and 1 or 2 percent SDS, very, very stringent conditions that Reinhard Lerman, uh, among others, had worked out to separate RNP complexes down to their basic components. And once these are uh, broken apart under stringent conditions, of course, NOVA may be bound to very, very long RNAs of the brain, so we cut them down uh, with partial enzymatic hydrolysis, or we could do this with alkaline hydrolysis, to make small RNAs of about, say, 50 nucleotides bound to NOVA. So that's all that's left. So when we purify that, um, this complex is so stuck together that we can then boil it in SDS and run it on a denaturing polyacrylamide gel. We can label the RNA so it's radioactive. And here this just shows the radioactive RNA is migrating with the NOVA protein, which is about 55 kilodaltons. And here's the same immunoprecipitation control experiment, which we did everything the same, including labeling the RNA, but we just skipped the UV irradiation in the beginning. And so we get a very beautiful signal to noise in these kinds of experiments. We can then transfer this to nitrocellulose, cut out the hot RNA protein complex, and then we work out conditions to remove the protein with proteinase K, put linkers on the RNA, PCR amplifying, and sequence them. And those sequences, those 50 nucleotide fragments that can be aligned to the genome and tell us on a genome-wide, unbiased way exactly what NOVA is binding to in the native brain. So this is an example of what the data looked like. We first published this um, in 2003 with 380 sequences of these 50 nucleotide tags. Um, each sequence cost me $8. So the total, about four grand. $4,000 uh, for 384 of these uh, tags. So this is an example of one of the tags. It was smack in the middle of an exon that is alternatively spliced in the brain. Sometimes it's skipped over and sometimes it's included. And in a wild type brain, most of the time it's skipped over, so it's shorter. Some of the time it's included, so it's longer. And this bind, not only does NOVA bind to this site, but it's a functional site. Because in the absence of NOVA, you don't skip this anymore. So actually, this is consistent with that blue part of the map I showed you, that when NOVA binds the alternate exon or immediately around it, it blocks splicing, so you get the smaller form. If you take NOVA away, you can't block anymore. So you always get the longer form. Now, fast forward to the last couple of years, we've repeated this whole experiment in more or less exactly the same way with a number of different RNA binding proteins, and I'll show you some data about this. Um, and we've added one new twist on this, which is high throughput sequencing. I tried to find a movie, but it's on the Illumina website, and it's password protected or something, I can't steal it. Um, but you can go and look at their technology. There's several companies, two leading ones, uh, Illumina and Life Sciences, that now are making machines that can sequence for the same $4,000, instead of 385 tags, um, last week we sequenced one in my laboratory. Uh, I gotta do a quick calculation. Ooh, we got 10 billion tags, 10 billion. So it's a huge change in data, okay? It's a, it's a, a revolution in science. And you should all be tuned into this because, of course, that $4,000 is quickly going to drop to $400. So the price of sequencing is plummeting and the amount of information you can extract from it is enormous. In between the two, there has to be computers to deal with all the data. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So, but this is a revolution that we've now applied to this question of RNA protein interactions in living tissues and our focus is on the brain. So I would just point out that this CLIP protocol is uh, not impossible, contrary to common rumor. So there have now been about 20 publications listed here, not all from our laboratory, from a whole bunch of different labs, using CLIP for different biologic scenarios, and different organisms have been used for CLIP. This is yeast. Um, Sandy Wolin at, uh, at Yale has done this with the eubacteria. Um, 
very interesting study here. Um, it's been done in mice, it's been done in tissue culture cells, it's been done in worms, it's been done in Drosophila. It, nobody's done it in plants yet. Hint. Okay. Uh, uh, another point about CLIP is that it's been continually improved upon, um, not only in our lab, but others. And that may be the best form of flattery because people keep coming up with new names for CLIP. Some of them are quite entertaining. Um, I've been, made a humorous slide here. You're supposed to be chuckling. <laughs> Just seeing how far behind my translation is. Okay. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this is the same protocol. Uh, we call it high throughput sequencing clip, or Gene Yo called it uh, clip C. Tom Tushel has a variation on this called uh, photoactivatable ribonucleoside enhanced clip, which I guess should be called pear clip, and he called it par clip. It's uh, something useful, maybe, in tissue culture. Um, uh, Yurna Yule, my student who helped develop the original clip, has an improvement which he called iClip. I think he named that after Macintosh Apple products. <laughs> and uh, David Tolerby has a variation on clip which he calls Crack Clip, which I believe is illegal in Mexico. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> now, um, what do you do with all these billions of bits of information? So Donnie Lickitolosi was the first one to tackle this high throughput clip problem. So uh, we did clip on mouse brain and got many, many tags. The original tags weren't in the billions, but were in the hundreds of thousands. This is first or second generation sequencer. I'll just run through the kind of things you have to do. You get, uh, he got 400,000 50 nucleotide tags off the machine. Uh, these had to be annotated so that they were matched up to where they lined to each 50 nucleotide tag were aligned to in the mouse genome. Um, then some tags were duplicates from PCR amplification, so we collapsed them into one. So we only looked for unique tags. Uh, and then we asked where in the genome do they align to with respect to known protein coding genes. That's the RefSeq database. <coughs> and about two-thirds or three quarters aligned to RefSeq genes, about a quarter aligned to intergenic sequences, which are quite interesting. Some of those may be non-coding RNAs of the sort uh, Joe was talking about. And then we do something called a cluster analysis, and I'll show you schematically what that means. Is if we do enough sequencing, we don't just get one tag for each position where NOVA is bound, but if we sequence and sequence ad nauseum, if you can translate that, I won't try. Um, you start to get tags that overlap each other. Um, and that looks like this. So if you sequence hundreds of thousands of tags, you will get spots where NOVA is bound in one molecule to this RNA and another molecule to this one, this one, this one. And these line up to give what we call a cluster. And the boundaries of that cluster provide an in vivo footprint on the RNA from the brain from where NOVA is binding. And it's a genome-wide footprint. So you get basically the landing site where NOVA is bound at every position in every RNA. And it can be ranked according to how robust these are. Some are very robust clusters, and some are less robust clusters. So um, now, if all of this analysis is valid, we expect the clusters to have the NOVA binding site in it. And I'll just tell you that by a couple of different analyses, they were extremely enriched. The top 500 clusters essentially all had repeats of this YCAY or TCAT in the DNA element. So that was good. Um, and we also wanted robustness in terms of biologic reproducibility. So, you know, if you do an experiment in the laboratory and get a great result, um, maybe it was humid that day and that was the reason. You have to always repeat your results. And it's much more true in a mouse than it is in a tissue culture dish. So it's really essential that um, one thinks about reproducibility of experiments, especially with an in vivo system like the brain. So this is the example where we took these clusters, each of which were reproducible because NOVA was binding it, each site. So each dash here represents a cluster. And these are the clusters all the way across to chromosome 19. And these are all the clusters we saw in one brain of one animal. 
We repeated the experiment with the brain of a second animal, and these are those clusters. And you can see they're very nicely correlated, both in the position of the clusters and the robustness, the extent of the clusters. It's not perfect, but it's about 90% um, high reproducibility in these two animals. We now can improve on that in different ways. So what does this data really look like in detail? So this is a gene map of a region showing graphically different genes that have clusters on the RNAs for NOVA binding. And I'm zooming in on one transcript here. This is an important transcript encoding an NMDA receptor. And what you can see here is there are positions where there's NOVA binding, and one is especially robust here. If we zoom in on that, it turns out here, this is an alternatively spliced exon, and blue is the blue animal, and red is the red animal, and each little dot here is a single nucleotide, 50 nucleotide tag. So all of this represents a very robust cluster that interestingly has three YCAYs uh, very close to space together. So this is a NOVA binding site where it's been cross-linked. And in fact, according to that map I showed you before, binding downstream of this exon should enhance exon inclusion, and so it does. So in a wild-type animal where NOVA is present, you get a lot of this exon included form. And if you take NOVA away in the knockout, now uh, the exon is not included very well and you get a big shift to this other isophore. Now we actually knew about this alternate exon from that exon junction array I showed you. But if you look elsewhere in the transcript, there are these little binding sites up here, so we can zoom in on them. And up here is an exon that was not on the exon junction microarray. But we can use CLIP as a discovery tool. And in fact, what we see here is that there are binding sites, and this briefly here and tell you that we can compile all the cluster tags from a whole number of transcripts that undergo NOVA-dependent splicing and derive a, a biochemically derived binding map that relates to alternative splicing. And in fact, when we normalize this appropriately, it very beautifully fits the um, prediction from the bioinformatic map that we had here. So the binding sites for NOVA, where there are cross-linked tags in the red positions, are transcripts where NOVA is enhancing exon inclusion, and where it's cross-linking in the blue position, it's blocking exon inclusion. Now, uh, I'll show you a few different examples of the kinds of things we can do with CLIP. One is um, to use it to drive biologic discovery in a very focused way. So this is an interesting thing to think about. I'm not going to go into detail, but Masato Yano in the laboratory published this paper last year that you can read about. But what he had observed was in NOVA, animals that are missing the NOVA2 gene, which is expressed up here in the neocortex, um, they have a migration defect. So if you look at this green stain here, um, neurons are normally born with a certain developmental pattern such that green neurons born at a given age should end up up here. And in the NOVA knockout, they end up down here instead. There are similar problems in the cerebellum. And the bottom line is that that suggests a defect in a well-characterized pathway called the reeling pathway. This is a signaling pathway that's known to give rise to neuronal migration defects, just of the sort I showed you on the last slide. So Masato took about 20 or 25 genes of this pathway did CLIP early in development when these uh, neurons should be migrating at E14, that's embryonic day 14, in an embryonic mouse. So he redid the CLIP there. And then asked for all of these genes, were there cross-linking tags? And if they were, did they change alternative splicing in any way that would make sense for explaining a defect in migration in the real and signaling pathway? And he found no. No hits, nothing made any sense out of this except one gene out of the 24 he looked at, which was uh, uh, an RNA encoding, a very critical uh, signal transduction protein called disabled 1, um, which has downstream of the real end and real end receptor signaling to uh, mediate critical pathways inside the neuron that allow it to migrate properly. And in fact, he could show that in the transcript uh, for real end 1, there's a very robust NOVA binding site near an alternative exon and early in development, but not late, for reasons we don't completely understand, but only early, there's a defect in the alternative splicing. You can see this big isoform here that happens at E14 in the knockout animals. So something very beautiful actually result in terms of the RT-PCR 
And he went on to prove that this alternative splice, this aberrant form here, um, is functional. So he could put that aberrant form into uh, an embryonic mouse brain by something called in utero electroporation, very difficult experiment where he operates on a pregnant mouse and uh, electroporates a DNA encoding this mutant splice isoform directly into the brain and then allows the mouse to be born. And when it's born, all of a sudden it has a migration defect. I don't know if you can see that, but up here are aberrantly migrated neurons when this abnormal form has been put in. And he can do the reciprocal experiment put the correct form into the Nova knockout mouse. And when he puts the correct form in, he rescues uh, the defect. So up here now, there's normal migration. A very, very beautiful set of experiments using CLIP in a directed way to discover a pathway that's relevant for a piece of biology that he was interested in. Another example has to do with this frontotemporal dimension Parkinson's I told you about. This is a genetic human disease in which people have splicing defects where they include an exon that uh, it, uh, causes too much inclusion of this particular exon encoding a piece of this protein. So the protein is called tau. It's a microtubule protein that's very important in Alzheimer's disease. It's very important in dementias and Parkinson's in general. And it has, it's, since it binds microtubules, it has four microtubule binding domains. If you include too much of this one, you bind microtubules too tightly. And it predisposes you to becoming demented, which is not good. And so we could look at this alternate exon here and use the NOVA map to ask, is it possible that NOVA could regulate this alternate exon? And in fact, we see robust binding sites here and here. You see the different colors. They're reproducible. Um, and those binding sites are downstream from this exon that suggests, according to this map, that Nova binding would include this exon. And in fact, we can show that it does. I don't think I have the data here. So that's bad. That means that Nova binding here could help promote, in patients maybe who are otherwise predisposed to dementia, could help promote too much of this exon of too tight binding um, of the tau protein to microtubules. So it suggests one thing you'd like to do is block Nova binding to these sites and maybe you could reverse this um, splicing excess. So we know exactly what those splices are. I mean, what those binding sites are. They're rich in YCAYs. We have the sequence here. And we can design antagonistic RNAs that are stable antisense RNAs to block uh, NOVA binding specifically to these sites out way in the middle of an intro that you would normally never be interested in. And presumably, nobody else is interested in it except me <coughs> and NOVA. So, um, so <laughs> maybe that's a little harsh. Um, at any rate, in fact, uh, Donnie and a student in the lab spent the summer showing, in fact, that they could use these antagonists to reverse the alternative splicing defect uh, of excess use of this alternate exon. A third illustrative example that I'm not going to go into, but just to bring in the point that bioinformatic integration with all of this information is extremely useful, is just illustrated in this cartoon. So this is work done by um, Challenge Zhang, a, a computational scientist in our laboratory. And you can read about it. We published this last year. And in this analysis, he took all of our CLIP data, which is very good but not perfect in predicting what NOVA function is. There are some binding sites that don't seem to be functional. And there are some sites where there's splicing, where there's no binding. So it's a very good correlation, but by itself, it's not a 100% accurate predictor of alternative splicing and NOVA dependence. But he combined it with motif analysis, looking for the YCAY clusters, which is OK, as I showed you, but not perfect, with data from exon junction arrays or RNA sequencing, and uh, other kinds of data from conservation of sequence, reading grains. And he did what's called a Bayesian network, in which no single one of these is necessary to produce a predicted target. But in combination, they all add to the statistical probability that a single site will or will not be a NOVA binding site. And he got just very beautiful results that I'm not going to go into. So I'm just illustrating uh, the general principle. Now, um, what would we like to do going forward? This is sort of the pyramid of where we stand with NOVA. We know it regulates uh, alternative splicing. 
uh, of a biologically coherent set of proteins. Those proteins themselves may interact to shape the actual function of the um, synapse in a mouse and we believe in a human. But of course, NOVA is not the only RNA binding protein in a cell. As I mentioned before, there are hundreds of proteins that are you know, what we would call professional RNA binding proteins that have high affinity domains for binding RNA and, and regulate directly their metabolism. So one direction that we're interested in with CLIP is to overlay the NOVA binding maps with those of other RNA binding proteins. One we're especially interested in and more or less completed the work on is the HU uh, uh, perineoplastic antigen that I mentioned in the very beginning, the fragile X mental retardation protein that I'll talk a little bit about, and an RNA binding protein that interacts physically with NOVA, which is the brain specific isoform of the polypyrimidine tract binding protein that Lynn mentioned. So when you get outside of the domain of NOVA, um, you may exit the domain of alternative splicing. And in fact, NOVA itself exits that domain because not all NOVA binding sites are in introns near alternative exons. So this just illustrates from Donnie's work when uh, he was looking at splicing, he also began to look at the three prime untranslated region. And there's many spots of very robust binding. We don't understand what many of them do, but some of them cluster around sites of alternative polyadenylation. And of course, this is an area of growing interest in um, biology right now because uh, the, the polyadenylation, which occurs in the three prime untranslated region that Lynn talked about, allow transcripts to have either short, in this case it would be a very short untranslated region, a medium, or a long one. And the longer it is, the more elements are left in that RNA for potential regulation by other RNA binding proteins. So, in fact, we can see that NOVA binds right around this polyadenylation site, and when we looked at more globally, there are a number of transcripts where NOVA bound around polyadenylation sites, and there seemed to be a positional map similar to the one we saw with splicing, where the binding site is in these green spots right next to the poly A site. We could show biochemically that NOVA will block usage of that poly A site, and the next one, the longer one, will be used. Uh, and if it's farther away, it can actually attract factors to that site and enhance um, the, the binding. So what is the importance of these other binding sites? Well, as I said, we don't know, but one very well-known uh, regulator of 3' prime untranslated uh, RNA regulation is this system that Joan referred to, um, which is the Argonaut microRNA system. So microRNAs, as, as was mentioned, um, are small RNAs on the order of, say, 22 nucleotides that bind to mRNA sequences in blue here. And they don't bind the whole way, the whole length. In fact, they only need to bind six nucleotides in a row. And if they do, they'll block this RNA from being translated into a protein. And the microRNAs are guided to these positions by a big protein in silver here, um, which is called Argonaut. Now, um, we became interested in trying to do CLIP with Argonaut for a number of reasons relating largely to the fragile X protein. Um, and when we did the clip here, what we found, unsurprisingly, was that uh, UV irradiation caused a covalent bond to form between the microRNA and the argonaut. And the argonaut is wrapped around the microRNA. It's very close contacts. And that reproduced data that Gideon Dreyfus and others have produced, um, uh, allowing us to delineate what the microRNAs are in the mouse brain. It's actually not very interesting because it had already been known and published. But interestingly, we noticed something else when we did this clip, which was that not only did we cross-link the microRNAs, but we cross-link longer pieces of RNA that when we sequenced them were messenger RNAs. And we hypothesized the following, which is that Argonaut, although it's intimately bound to the microRNA, comes close enough, maybe transiently, to the messenger RNA bounding the microRNA binding site that it can be cross-linked semi-efficiently in these positions. And um, when we sequenced these mRNA tags, they clustered up at certain loci, the, uh, of the sort I mentioned previously. And this led to the prediction that if we map these out carefully, that right in the middle of this cluster should be a microRNA seed site, six nucleotides from one of the predicted brain microRNAs. And in fact, that turned out to be the case. So <clears throat> I'll just show you in a schematic where does Argonaut bind? 
in RNAs in the brain, surprisingly, only about 40% of argonaut binding is in the three prime untranslated region. There's lots of binding in other places, coding sequence, intronic regions, non-coding RNAs. Um, and are these sites real or not? Well, we tried to validate them by looking at a few specific uh, mRNAs and uh, doing assays like Luciferous <coughs> reporter assays. And, and this is just one example I'm going to show you. So this is one brain transcript. This is the three prime untranslated region. And these are all the microRNA seed sequences, six or seven nucleotides predicted uh, by target scan, Miranda, and other programs uh, where microRNAs potentially could bind according to matching the seed sequence and being conserved across species. And in fact, what we did was then to do the RNA clip in the brain as where is Argonaut actually bound with respect to this map. And in fact, this is what the map looks like. Now each color is a different animal and we did this in five different animals. So these are very robust Argonaut binding sites. And it binds one, two, three, four, five spots. And these spots here have right in the middle of them predicted microRNAs. So this is predicted to be a MER-124 site. This is predicted to be MER-26, etc. And in fact, this MER-124 site had previously been validated by this group as a, a, a functional MER-124 site in that they could mutate it with cyprase assays and lose the argonaut microRNA effect on translation. This one had been predicted as a binding site. This one had not been predicted, interestingly, because it's not conserved in species, across species. It's present in the mouse, but it's not present in the human. So the target scan predictions would have missed that. Um, and in fact, we think um, it's actually a functional site. So one can zoom out from this sort of picture. This is the gene I just showed you. There's the binding sites in the 3' UTR. There are a few binding sites in the coding region. You can zoom the dial out even further. And this is the local gene region. Not every gene is regulated by Argonaut, even though they're expressed in the brain, but some of them are. And you can zoom out for the whole chromosome here and the whole genome. So this is every transcript on chromosome 8. And for each transcript where there's an Argonaut binding site, we can tell you precisely where it's bound and which predicted microRNA uh, is being bound there. One can then zoom back in and, for example, pull out all the red sites, which refer MER-124, or all the blue sites from MER-125, et cetera, and ask what do they code for, just like we did for NOVA, and get a biologic coherence map for the kinds of functions these microRNAs might be playing in the brain. And in fact, they do seem to be, as predicted from the literature, but here on a genome-wide scale, uh, coordinating different uh, aspects of biology in, in a way similar to what NOVA did, really. So, I'm going to end with um, a last bit of um, work that is uh, unpublished on the Fragile X syndrome. So we're interested in pursuing this sort of clip biology uh, into um, human disease. And one way to do that is to do clip on human brains, and we've worked out conditions where we can do this, uh, and take normal brain and human brain and compare the maps in the two. There are a lot of difficulties with that, as you can imagine. The other way to do that is in parallel, do it in mouse models of human disease. So the disease now I'm going to turn to is Fragile X syndrome. Why are we interested in it? First of all, it's a very important disease worldwide. It's the leading cause of genetic, the leading genetic cause of mental retardation. Um, and it's really the poster child for a link between um, a cognitive dysfunction in a human and um, gene control at the level of a single um, mutated gene product. So it was cloned in 1991 and turned out to be an RNA binding protein. So the loss of this one RNA binding protein leads to severe cognitive dysfunction. So that's a fertile ground for trying to put together neuroscience and molecular biology. Now, another reason we're interested is because the Fragile X protein has great similarities to NOVA. It has two paired KH domains, a space, and these are RNA binding domains, a spacer, and a third different kind of RNA binding domain. Um, a final reason is that while many patients with the Fragile X syndrome have uh, the disease because they have an expanded triplet repeat that leads to uh, hypermethylation and loss of transcription, so it's a loss of function of the whole gene, 
which doesn't actually help tell us which of these regions are important for the mental retardation. There is one patient who has an isoleucine to asparagine missense mutation, only one, um, who was very informative. It was described a long time ago. The patient's still alive. And uh, this patient has a mutation right in the middle of the second KH RNA binding domain. And in fact, if we go back to the NOVA structure, it's one of these side chain amino acids that helps coordinate the UCAU, or UCAC, in the structure. So it's right smack in the middle of the RNA specificity domain. Um, and in fact, to explore this in more detail, last year and a half ago now, I guess we published a knock-in mouse in which we exactly reproduced this mutation. And this mouse has severe mental retardation, as far as that goes for a mouse. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it's actually, in many ways, a, a better model for the disease than, than the full knockout. <laughs> Getting punchy here as we're closing in on the hour and a half mark. Okay, so I'm going to go a little quickly through some of this. The what does the Fragile X protein do? It's an RNA binding protein. It's abundant in the brain. Its loss of function leads to mental retardation. Well, one of the first observations we made um, was to address some ambiguity in the literature and demonstrate quite definitively in the mouse brain, um, fragile X protein is on polyribosomes. So how do we know that? Um, we actually know it now by electron microscopy, but the standard way to do that is biochemically, to take polyribosomes from a mouse brain, make it sort of gush the brain up. Oh, that may not be translatable, sorry. Smash the brain up. And um, uh, put it on a sucrose gradient and spin it in an ultracentrifuge and then take fractions out that are very heavy with sucrose and lighter fractions. And what we see is fragile X is out here in very heavy fractions, meaning these are the fractions where many polyribosomes, many ribosomes are on transcripts. So it appears that fragile X may have something to do with translational control, where the RNA is being translated by the ribosomes. Now, um, Jennifer, my wife in the lab and a graduate student, um, Claire uh, Walton um, did a series of experiments similar to what we had done with NOVA, looking at RNA targets in vitro. I'm not going to go into that. Um, but the net result was that we were able to sort of cobble together a hypothesis whereby the protein, fragile X protein itself, might be binding elements that would tether it to the polyribosome. So that was sort of our initial working hypothesis. But the way to really nail that question, in our view, was to do CLIP. And CLIP was very difficult with fragile X protein. And again, Jennifer spearheaded this project. And what we ended up doing was to make polyribosomes from a wild type mouse or a mouse missing the fragile X protein as a control, do cross linking on these. And we've reproduced this now by doing cross linking on the whole brain. But the initial experiments are taking pooled polyribosome fractions, cross linking fragile X with its RNA in there and asking what does it bind to by CLIP. And again, this was done under very stringent conditions. I'm just going to fly through uh, the bottom line, which is that um, when we sequenced the 50 nucleotide tags that um, FMRP was binding to, we got a big surprise. So instead of binding discrete sites like NOVA did in your intron or in the 3' ETR or in the coding sequence, what we, what we found was that fragile X seemed to bind very specifically to transcripts across the coding sequence. That means between the start codon and the stop codon. And there's a little binding in the 3' ETR, but it falls way off, and almost no binding in the 5' ETR. In contrast, in the experiments we've done with the HU protein, which is thought to regulate gene expression by binding 3' ETR elements, we see almost no binding in the coding sequence and lots of binding in the 3' ETR. Now, this is a population average of many CLIP experiments on many transcripts. So what happens if we look at individual RNAs? And again, uh, what we see is the same pattern. So these are different colors, many different CLIP tags from many different FMRP CLIP experiments, seven biologic replicates. And what we see is that, again, on this transcript, which is the number one hit in coding of an important protein called bassoon, on this one, KIF-1A, on this one, Centaurin Gamma-1, very important, interesting proteins, all of them. Um, FMRP codes the coding region and then falls off in the 3' untranslated region. And compare that again with HU, where we did side-by-side -side, um, cross-linking in-brain polyribosome. 
and A2 binds only single spots that are rich in its binding element, which is not exactly what the literature says its binding element is. It's close. U stretches with a period. So what do we think is going on with fragile X here? <coughs> um, to, to figure that out, um, we developed an in vitro translation system, similar uh, to uh, what you might use in what's called a reticulocyte lysate system, only we spike it with mouse brain extracts. So we developed a way to take basically the mouse brain um, where fMRP was present and allow translation to go on. And what is this, this is the sucrose profile here. And again, here's fMRP on these heavy polyribosome fractions. And you can see poly A binding protein is on all RNAs. HU is on some polyribosomes here. And the ribosomal protein P0 is stretched across this fraction on big polysomes as well as small and monosomes here. Now, we took these um, polyribosomes from the mouse brain and allowed translation to continue. And we did it with a drug called puramycin that um, causes the ribosome to fall off as soon as it incorporates a single amino acid, because puramycin is an amino acid analog that makes the ribosome fall off. And when we do that, um, the RNA binding proteins like P0 shift from up here down to the beginning of the gradient because the ribosomes have fallen off and are now in light fractions here. And the same is true for HU and for poly A binding protein. While fMRP is left on relatively heavy fractions that have many, putatively many ribosomes left on them. So what do we think is going on? Um, I'll show you two different sets of experiments that get at this question. So this is looking now um, on the same gradients, looking at mRNA distribution on these gradient profiles. So we're not, the, the last graph, I'll just show you again. This is looking at, on the y-axis, is the total RNA. It's mostly a measure of the ribosomal RNA. So there's lots of ribosomes in the monosomes. There's lots in these uh, polyribosomes, and then it tails off here. Now, the question is, what about different mRNAs that fMRP is binding to, or abundant brain mRNAs that fMRP is not binding to? How do they behave in this sort of assay? So these are the mRNA distribution plots. Um, on a sucrose gradient for RNAs that are not bound by fMRP. And we have lots of this sort of data. So if you look before the runoff, uh, in the presence of cyclohexamide to freeze everything in the yellow, you'll see the RNA is on heavy fractions of the polysome gradient, because that's where it's being translated. It has lots of ribosomes on it. And when we allow it to run off, they move to these lighter fractions. Here, the RNA shifts because the ribosomes are falling off of it. It's being translated. And that looks exactly the same whether uh, we, take, we look at that RNA from an fMRP knockout mouse brain or a wild-type mouse brain. The profile is identical. It's also identical if we look in the I304N mouse or in these polysome gradients that have been treated with an RNA aptamer that knocks fMRP off. And we showed that in the paper several years ago, a high-affinity ligand that knocks fMRP off the polysome. This RNA could care less whether fMRP is present or not. It translates just fine from this position on the gradient to this position on the gradient. Now, fMRP targets, where fMRP is bound across the coding sequence, all show this very consistent shift where the RNA runs off this far if fMRP is present in the wild-type brain, and it runs off farther, lower down on the gradient, uh, if we take fMRP away, either in the knockout animal the I304N animal, or by knocking fMRP off with this RNA aptamer. And we have lots and lots of data. These are three other, or three examples of RNAs that are abundant in the brain, same size as fMRP transcripts, on polyribosome, but show no difference in this assay in their distribution, whether fMRP is present or not. And we have, this is representative of 22 targets essentially all of which, there's a couple of outliers, show these profound differences in their ability to be translated in a wild-type animal and a knockout animal. So basically, what's, what these graphs are showing us is that the ribosomes are not moving as much, not translating as well when fMRP is present than when we take fMRP away. And that can be taken away acutely here. So a model for what's happening here, and this is uh, nearing the end, 
is that a transcript that doesn't have fMRP on it translates just fine in the presence or absence of fMRP. Um, a transcript that has fMRP on it has what we believe to be blocked ribosomal complexes. Um, and even after adding pyromycin, these stay blocked and we can digest them with a, a nuclease called micrococcal nuclease and they stay blocked. We can look at them in we get the electron microscope. They look like ribosomal complexes and we've in fact done clip on these and the clip is exactly the same as the clip in the wild type green. So, and that's shown, illustrated here. So the bottom line is that fMRP is acting on a trimolecular complex that consists of mRNA targets, ribosomal RNA, and fMRP itself to block ribosomal elongation. And we think perhaps it does this in a dynamic fashion in the brain to put the brakes on translation on, on certain transcripts to keep their levels down. So what are those transcripts? I'll just show you briefly. We can identify them in a very statistic, statistically robust fashion. The top 840 targets that fMRP binds to turn out, to, again, to be a subset of both pre- and postsynaptic proteins. So to illustrate that on this slide, here's the synapse, where the axon is coming down. Here's the dendrite, where most researchers in the field have studied possible actions of fragile X protein on synaptic biology. And now we can fill in the answer key as to what are the RNAs that fMRP is regulating and coding for. And these are what they code for on the presynaptic side, and these are what they code for on the postsynaptic side. Um, I'll have to confiscate those cameras afterwards. Only kidding. Um, so, <laughs> so basically, Fragile X is inhibiting, putting the brakes on, basically regulating the stoichiometry of the protein proteome uh, for the pre- and postsynaptic uh, control of neural circuits. And in fact, the last point I'm going to make is that that's true not only for Fragile X syndrome, but we can overlay this set of 840 targets on the autism disease. So that's of interest because a growing number of uh, diagnoses of autism have been made recently, and this is more appreciated as a relatively common childhood problem. And 90% of kids with Fragile X syndrome have autistic features. So there's a great overlap. Missing the at Fragile X gene causes, among other things, the specific defects in facial contact and recognition that autistic kids have. So Michael Wigler and others have promoted the idea that autism may be due to defects in gene copy number of certain genes, and they'd like to know which genes they are. One way to do that is to look at genes, syndromes that cause autism. These are large chromosomal deletions. They have many, many gene deletions in them. And among the things wrong in these kids is autism. And in each of these, there are fragile X targets in there, which is actually a statistically robust result. Um, and in fact, if we look at the gene copy number duplications that Michael Wigler has looked at, um, we find a very disproportionate number of overlapping target hits between what fragile X is regulating and the genes that are thought to cause autism, particularly causing autism by gene duplication as opposed to other ones that cause gene deletion. So, we think Fragile X is putting the brakes on genes. If you take Fragile X away, you get too much expression. Or if you have a gene uh, du duplication, you get too much expression. So these are converging bits of evidence um, that the Fragile X protein and autism has something biochemically in common. So the end is near. A cute trick in uh, giving seminars is that you can make these hot links. And if your time is up like mine, as you press this, skip a whole bunch of slides. So I, uh, I'm just going to take you to the end here and summarize some of the points I've been making. RNA protein interactions are important in basic biology and they're important in human disease. Um, they can be approached through different kinds of strategies now. In, in particular, we're obviously enamored with this biochemical cross-linking strategy that we're interested in applying to human disease. We're happy to help anybody who's interested in this. And uh, for better or for worse, this is going to require intense computational science as well. The model that we're leading up to is that the many different RNA binding proteins in the brain are all present together. And that as we start to make maps for different proteins here, we can begin to overlay them and see regions 
where there is intense binding by some proteins, scattered binding by others. In some cases, these binding sites may be agonistic, in some cases antagonistic, and ultimately, I think, if we get enough information, there may be some sort of a code with which one can decode all of these maps and say that this will be regulated in a certain way uh, with a certain combination of RNA binding proteins. And in human disease, that code may be screwed up. Uh, maybe that's not translatable, but dysregulated um, in a way that uh, leads to defects in some RNA uh, key regulatory uh, RNAs in the brain. So I want to just thank the members of my laboratory. Uh, Jennifer Garnell is my compatriot in the lab. Uh, Joel Richter helped with the um, Fragile X project in a sabbatical he did. And I'm very lucky to have a large number of very talented students and postdoctoral fellows collaborating with a number of people uh, that I tried to mention uh, as I showed their work. Um, and a number of excellent people in the past have helped me. So with that, I will thank you for your attention. And one last thing is I did bring a, um, ah, I brought this so that you can ask questions on Espanol. Thank you for your attention.